purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using a peer-to-peer -peer network. What you just heard are the opening lines of a nine-page white paper published in November of 2008. This white paper was written by an unknown individual named Satoshi Nakamoto, who emerged onto the world stage with this proposal. The title of the report was Bitcoin, a Peer-to-Peer -peer Electronic Cash System, and it was a thorough approach to a very divisive topic. You see, this was the first time that the word Bitcoin would enter the public vernacular. It was also a well-documented proposal, full of sources for its grandiose claims, and contained a comprehensive plan to do what many believed was the impossible. For years, decades even, cypherpunk enthusiasts and libertarian-minded programmers had been yearning for a digital-based currency. Cryptocurrency, if you will. And there had been repeated attempts to fill this niche, such as B-Money, Hashcash, and Bitgold. However, unfortunately, all of these reached a dead end in their pursuit of a decentralized banking system. They had neither the scope nor the security to grow into their idealized goals. With their failures, the idea of cryptocurrency had become something of a fantasy. But this white paper, which debuted online in November of 2008, proposed to change all of that. And it would, with the proposal leading to the birth of Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency that is now synonymous with the word itself. However, at the time, skeptics didn't put a lot of faith into this proposal. Not only was it trying to do the impossible, but the person behind it was an unknown. They had virtually no web profile, no known backing, no identity. To this day, many still wonder what led to the creation of Bitcoin, and who the person behind it actually was. A person who would now be one of the richest people on the planet, but whose identity has never been discovered. This is the story of Satoshi Nakamoto. Welcome to Unresolved. I am your host, Michael Whelan. Before I really get started with today's episode, I just want to say a few things. First of all, I want to give a huge shout out to my friend, a concerned citizen, who you may know as the host of the Swindled podcast. They were kind enough to help out with today's episode, and I owe them big time for participating in this one. If you have not listened to Swindled yet, you need to do so. Lastly, if you want to help support Unresolved, please head to iTunes or Apple Podcasts to leave the show a rating and review. And if you want to go even further than that, and get access to bonus episodes, such as the North Augusta Huddle House shooting episode I'm about to upload, please head to patreon.com slash unresolvedpod. Every bit of support is appreciated, and I am so grateful to those of you that have helped Unresolved in the past and in the future going forward. Now, without any further ado, let's learn a bit more about the enigmatic figure that jump-started a financial revolution. In 2005, a profile was created on the website of P2P Foundation, an organization which studies the impact of peer-to-peer -peer technology, especially in regards to societal effects. The profile belonged to Satoshi Nakamoto, supposedly Satoshi, as he would later be known among crypto communities online, claimed to be from Japan. His birthday was listed as April 5th, 1975 which seemed innocuous at first. However, many have tried to find meaning in the date, pointing out that April 5th happened to be the day in which US President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed two executive orders back in 1933, the first of which created the Civilian Conservation Corps, and the second of which forbade the hoarding of gold coin, bullion, and certificates by private citizens. Then, the year, 1975, happened to be the year in which gold ownership was re-legalized for US citizens. It's possible that these dates are just misnomers, but I find them worth mentioning. Others have also tried to decipher the meaning of the name, Satoshi Nakamoto, 
Many think that it's a jumbling together of large Japanese-American companies. Samsung, Toshiba, Nakayama, and Motorola. Take the first few letters of each and you end up with Satoshi Nakamoto. Others point to the literal translations of the names. Satoshi roughly meaning wise in Japanese, and the Nakamoto family surname meaning central origin, or something like that. I know that all of this is a bit of a stretch, but I'd feel pretty remiss not mentioning any of this before we get into some of the theories later on. Many have tried to find meaning in everything said or done by this mysterious figure, and they point to these original building blocks as providing a lot of structure for Satoshi's later actions. Years after the creation of the profile on P2P Foundation, in which nothing of note was posted or accomplished by this enigmatic figure, something began stirring behind the scenes. On August 18th, 2008, three years later, the domain name Bitcoin.org was registered through a Japanese registry service. This service, which kept names anonymous, was used by a Japanese internet service provider to register the domain. This is the first time that anything to do with the word Bitcoin appeared in the public realm. It had not appeared in any other documents or registries up until this point, but would be joined just months later by a significant publication. On November 1st, 2008, the nine-page white paper I told you about in the introduction was published. Titled Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, the paper was well documented and articulate, and seemed to address many of the problems that critics and skeptics had had in the past with prior digital currencies. The author of the article was listed as Satoshi Nakamoto, and an email address listed just below that author's name came from an anonymous German email service. The white paper addressed all manner of flaws with prior cryptocurrency attempts. How they all start with an idea, but often lack in security and encryption, and eventually get bogged down in either trying to prevent outside attacks, or trying to subvert outside influence. This person's idea was a decentralized approach, one that put its fate not in the hands of one individual or a group, i.e. a bank or another authority figure, but rather to put the fate in everyone involved. If you're familiar at all with peer-to-peer -peer networking, then you know that it is an effective way to spread information. It is the type of system used by torrenting or the anonymous Tor browser. It was using this technology that Satoshi Nakamoto proposed taking the power away from a central authority. The root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. At around the same time that Satoshi Nakamoto and their thorough nine-page analysis began floating around the internet, the world's economy was in a very precarious spot. The tail end of 2007 saw a sharp decline in economic growth, and the following February, US President George W. Bush signed the Economic Stimulus Act of 2008 into law. The next several months saw the collapse of financial juggernauts Bear Stearns, IndyMac, and Lehman Brothers, establishments that, just a year before, had been regarded as too big to fail. So, as this climate escalated, along with unemployment rates and record levels of debt, a mysterious figure began making plans for a decentralized banking system. In 2009, the first blocks of Bitcoin were created by Satoshi Nakamoto. In the notes of this code, identified as the Genesis block by Bitcoin users, the enigmatic Satoshi Nakamoto left a permanent record of the day's volatile climate. In the Genesis block, Satoshi preserved the day's news headline. They quoted the January 3rd, 2009 headline of the London-based newspaper, The Times, which read, Chancellor on brink of second bailout for banks. It seemed to be making a political point, pointing out the flaws of the current capitalistic banking system, which led to increased taxes for the users and bailouts for the banks that mishandled the money. In addition, this also seemed to serve as a document for the date, like what you would imagine from someone taking a hostage photo. 
it provided indisputable proof that the Genesis block of Bitcoin was created on January 3rd, 2009, at approximately 1815 GMT. It was about a week later, on January 9th, 2009, that Bitcoin was finally released to the public. Version 0.1 was released on SourceForge, a website where users can create and promote open-sourced software. The code for the program was written in C++, indicating that the user was likely up-to-date with modern computer languages. Perhaps the creator was even on the young side. Others point out that the notation style of the software's code was similar to that of someone around the age of 50, but it's impossible to tell from the code alone. The total build of Bitcoin 0.1 was around 31,000 lines, but those 31,000 lines would end up changing the world. Bitcoin drew major influences from prior cryptocurrency attempts, but was remarkably different in very interesting and profound ways. The major selling point of Bitcoin, off the bat, was that it was decentralized. It was a digital currency that could be sent to and received at an account address, and the owner of the currency would have a digital key to unlock it. This key was kept privately, and could be stored on a CD or flash drive, anything with storage really. But from the beginning, it was apparent that Bitcoin fixed one of the major flaws people had had with digital currency. Oftentimes, a digital type of currency led to double spending. That is, when you have a digital coin, for example, and you simply make a copy of it. In prior cryptocurrencies, people could copy the currency once or twice over, and then keep spending the copies. It'd be like you being able to photocopy a dollar bill. It would just devalue the currency and make it ineffective. To fix this, and become prominent on a global stage, Bitcoin needed to stand apart. This is where peer-to-peer -peer networking came in. Peer-to-peer -peer networking became the main attraction for Bitcoin because it created a type of public ledger known as the blockchain. The blockchain is constantly being updated, with transactions being added to the blockchain, and the system using peer-to-peer -peer networking to constantly update it. Essentially, the system operates with no central figure. There is no server where all of the money is stored. It's stored privately in everyone's account, but each transaction is a public record, and each transaction is then added to the endless blockchain. From there, the peer-to-peer -peer network, which is every computer connected to the network, keeps the blockchain updated through a process known as mining. Bitcoin mining is a system that adds transactions to the blockchain, but also incentivizes users of Bitcoin to remain active. Those that support the blockchain are rewarded in Bitcoin, which is given out for every block added to the chain. I know that some of you may be somewhat overwhelmed right now, and trust me, you're not alone. I'm a total newbie when it comes to cryptocurrencies, so this was pretty confusing for me as well. However, all you really need to know is that Bitcoin was a currency created to cut out the middleman. It made every transaction public, and kept power in the hands of those that participated in the system. Essentially, it took the bank's role away from the banking system, and made it an open-source, peer-to-peer network. Satoshi Nakamoto, the creator, seemed to be aware that Bitcoin would remain worthless if a cap wasn't established, so the system was launched with an end goal in mind. The system was created to reward a grand total of 21 million Bitcoin when all was said and done, but that will hopefully not be for many, many years. Each single Bitcoin can be reduced in millions of parts, and the most basic units, roughly 100 million units for every Bitcoin, have since become identified as Satoshi, named after the currency's founder. Bitcoin miners, those that participate in the system, can earn Bitcoin by mining, but early users were the most well rewarded. For every 210,000 additions to the blockchain, the public ledger that keeps transactions open sourced, the reward for miners gets cut in half, and that will continue until all 21 million bitcoins have eventually been mined. It's a very complicated system, and it's one that I hope makes sense for those of you that are as inexperienced in digital currencies as I am. However, it was thoroughly analyzed by the founder of Bitcoin, and seemed poised to remain prominent for some time. In the earliest days of Bitcoin, there were very few users. 
The program launched in January of 2009 to very little fanfare. After all, it was an open-sourced cryptocurrency launched by a complete unknown, so it's no surprise that there weren't many early adopters. The first few days consisted of the mysterious founder, Satoshi Nakamoto, being the only person to contribute to the blockchain. Because of this, Satoshi earned nearly a million Bitcoin by the system's rewarding program, which gave them credit for being one of the only people to mine early on. For reference, a million Bitcoin is nearly 5% of the unit's total amount. Like I said, Bitcoin was created to deplete after 21 million units. So being able to obtain and hoard nearly a million Bitcoin is now seen as an impossibility. It's roughly 5% of Bitcoin's total value, and it was earned in the first few months of the program's usage. Satoshi seemed to reach out to early adopters of the system, and was receptive to suggestions for future fixes. Crypto legend Hal Finney became one of Bitcoin's earliest users. In fact, he was the second person to actually use Bitcoin, after the founder. He received a small payment from the mysterious Satoshi, becoming the only other user of the currency for a short period of time. A coder named Marty Malmi, who went by the username of Sirius, became one of Bitcoin's earliest users. He began contributing to the project, and became the second known person to work on the project itself after Satoshi. When Bitcoin version 0.2 was released later that year, in December of 2009, the project had been overhauled by much of Marty Malmi's code. This included Linux support, which Malmi had made possible. Throughout 2009, the project continued to grow and prepared for a more scaled usage. It was still very rough around the edges, but as others began to contribute to the project, it became a much more idealized version of a cryptocurrency. Throughout 2009, the program continued to grow. By the end of the year, when version 0.2 was released, the program began to spread rapidly through Cypher and crypto circles. In 2010, a couple of contributors began working on the project. Over the next several years, they would become integral to the growth of Bitcoin, and would become permanently tied to the currency's history. Gavin Andreessen, formerly known as Gavin Bell, was a former Silicon Valley software developer who described himself as quote-unquote mostly libertarian. He discovered Bitcoin in 2010, and it appealed to his political and personal principles. He then made the decision to reach out to Bitcoin's founder, Satoshi, and began working on the code and offering up potential fixes throughout the year. When Satoshi began taking a backseat in the growth of Bitcoin, it was Andreessen that would become the de facto guide for Bitcoin's continued growth. Another prominent member of this ragtag group of coders and designers was a programmer named Laszlo Hanyech, who had become an early user of Bitcoin. He offered to help out, and sent an email to Satoshi, offering his assistance. Quote, I thought Bitcoin was awesome, and I wanted to be involved. But I had a regular developing job. Nakamoto would send me emails like, Hey, can you fix this bug? Hey, can you do this? He'd say, Hey, the West Coast is down. Or... We have these bugs, we need to fix this. I'd be like, we? We're not a team. I thought that it was approval from him, that maybe he accepted me as a member. But I didn't want the responsibility. I didn't really understand all of the forces that were going on at the time. I'd say, hey, you're not my boss. I didn't take it too seriously, though. On May 22nd, 2010, Bitcoin was used for its first ever actual transaction, when Laszlo Hanyich used Bitcoin to buy two pizzas. He sent the Bitcoin, 10,000 in total, to someone in England, who in return, used their credit card to pay for pizzas. This would become a holiday in cryptocurrency circles in the coming years, with May 22nd being venerated as Bitcoin Pizza Day. Despite those 10,000 Bitcoins now being worth tens of millions of actual dollars, Laszlo says that he's not bitter about it. As Bitcoin began to become popular in digital circles, many wondered what its intention was. Its founder, the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto, remained pretty tight-lipped about why they had created the cryptocurrency. However, through some of their online correspondence, we have been able to decipher some potential inspirations. It had seemed, 
from the origins of the Genesis block, when Satoshi inserted a link to a news article about a bank bailout. That Satoshi was upset about the way capitalism had inspired too-big-to-fail banking. And the creation of Bitcoin itself seemed to be a circumvention of that system. In 2010, programmer Laszlo Hanyech, the originator of the Pizza Day meme, asked Satoshi how long he had been working on the design for Bitcoin. Since 2007, at some point I became convinced there was a way to do this without any trust required at all and couldn't resist to keep thinking about it. Much more of the work was designing than coding. Fortunately, so far, all the issues raised have been things I previously considered and planned for. Laszlo seemed to be the one who got the closest to learning about Satoshi's true identity and intentions, but even those were held pretty guarded. Throughout their conversations, which mostly dealt with bugs in Bitcoin's code, Laszlo learned that Satoshi only ever responded at the end of the week. Oftentimes, he would email the Bitcoin founder throughout the week, but would receive all of his responses in one fell swoop on the weekends. Quote, I just assumed he was busy working on other stuff. Laszlo tried to ask personal questions about Satoshi, but the mysterious founder always avoided them. Quote, he or she or whoever it was never told me anything personal. I asked a few questions, but he always dodged them. Those questions never got answered. Laszlo says that this was a little annoying because he wanted to learn about the person he was working with. However, he says it was not really important. Quote, It's exciting because people love a man of mystery, but I try to steer people towards the fact that it doesn't matter who made it. He could be a psycho killer. People like to identify with heroes or villains, but in the cryptosphere, your code has to speak for itself. Charisma and being an interesting person only gets you so far when you're a developer. Ultimately, you'll be judged on the quality of your code and your idea. Throughout 2010, as Bitcoin began to emerge as the leading candidate to the world's cryptocurrency conundrum, Satoshi Nakamoto became a spiritual leader to cypherpunks everywhere. In fact, I've told you that Bitcoin itself can be reduced into many thousands and millions of parts. The most basic of these units, the Bitcoin equivalent of a penny, have now been nicknamed Satoshi in honor of the mysterious originator. Coders and software enthusiasts throughout the globe followed his or her post religiously. Many began to try and decipher the post for any signs of a hidden code and the language from the post were analyzed in the hopes of identifying the person behind them. In this analysis, many things were learned. It was observed that Satoshi Nakamoto seemed to have a great grasp of the English language. This was definitely not just a foreigner trying to mimic English, as they had a seemingly perfect understanding of grammar and punctuation. Satoshi's earliest post seemed to indicate that they were American, based on the phrases and wording that they used. However, shortly after starting Bitcoin, they transitioned into more and more UK-based jargon. They began to use the English spelling of certain words over the Americanized versions, adding the used to words like favor and color. They also used the spelling of gray that had an E instead of an A and they used S's instead of Z's in words like optimize and modernize. In various online posts, they even used the word flat to describe an apartment, maths instead of math, and described something as bloody hard, all of which, of course, indicated that the user was from the UK. A Swiss coder named Stefan Thomas created a graph of the timestamps in which Satoshi was active online, putting together all of their forum and blog posts. This graph visually highlighted that Satoshi was inactive between the hours of 5 to 11 a.m. in GMT. Translated to the east coast of the U.S., this was between the hours of midnight to 6 a.m. Based on this, it became publicly theorized that whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was, they likely lived on the east coast of the United States, and had adopted some UK jargon to throw off their true identity. In December of 2010, drama began stirring up some potential trouble in the Bitcoin community. As I've stated, throughout the year, the digital currency had become popular on the internet, but had yet to really break through into the mainstream. 
That began to change towards the end of the year, when Bitcoin made it into international news headlines. Next, WikiLeaks and the cyber attacks surrounding it. Last night, we looked at the legal challenges ahead for the website and its founder, Julian Assange. Since its latest release of confidential government documents, WikiLeaks has also been the target of computer hackers. Its supporters are striking back, temporarily shutting down MasterCard's website and targeting other companies who are severing ties with WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks, the organization that became prominent for releasing government secrets via the internet announced their intention to begin accepting donations via Bitcoin. After all, most banks and financial institutions were refusing to work with WikiLeaks, and their PayPal accounts had been shut down by various government entities, so they were looking for a more open-sourced alternative. Hence, Bitcoin, the emerging cryptocurrency, becoming the obvious choice. Satoshi Nakamoto, the anonymous founder of Bitcoin, was not too pleased with this decision. They had been working for over a year now to continue building up Bitcoin, and were hoping for it to grow into a legitimate avenue for payment. They were hoping that it would grow into a commonly accepted currency, and was worried that an association with WikiLeaks would damage its integrity. At the very least, it would attract unwanted attention and scrutiny from international figures, such as the US government. One user on a Bitcoin forum stated about an article published in PC World on December 11th, quote, the article implies that Bitcoin was invented as a result of WikiLeak troubles, as sort of an alternative solution to WikiLeak's donation funding troubles. In response, Satoshi responded to the article, and the various comments, with what would become one of their last public remarks. It would have been nice to get this attention in any other context. WikiLeaks has kicked the hornet's nest, and the swarm is headed towards us. About a week later, on December 19th, 2010, software developer Gavin Andreessen announced that he was taking a more active role in the leadership of Bitcoin moving forward. Quote, With Satoshi's blessing, and with great reluctance, I'm going to start doing more active management for Bitcoin. It was unknown at the time, but the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto already had one foot out of the door. They were in the middle of their disappearing act, which would not become public knowledge until April of the following year. In April of 2011, Satoshi Nakamoto officially vanished. In an email sent to a Bitcoin developer, Satoshi stated, I've moved on to other things. As such, Satoshi was no longer involved in the development or the growth of Bitcoin. Satoshi's last forum message came in December of 2010, and that is when they seemed to stop all contributions to Bitcoin or the emerging community. Their Bitcoin forum account remains active, and its last known login date was just a few days after the news regarding WikiLeaks, December 13th. Satoshi Nakamoto ended up disappearing with close to 1 million Bitcoins. This has grown into a fortune in the years since. As Bitcoin has continued to grow in popularity, so has that fortune, figuring now in the billions of dollars. In that entire time, it has gone untouched. Many have speculated as to why Satoshi Nakamoto decided to leave at the time in which he, she, or they did. The most obvious choice is that Satoshi, whoever they were, saw the writing on the walls. They had done an outstanding job covering up their identity and the creation of Bitcoin, but realized that the currency's involvement with WikiLeaks could only lead to oversight, regulation, and perhaps even punishment for creating an unregulated currency. Satoshi had made public pleas for WikiLeaks to not pursue Bitcoin as a donation service, insisting that doing so would only harm the value of Bitcoin and result in WikiLeaks getting quote-unquote pocket change. WikiLeaks did seem to hold off for a time, but ended up incorporating a Bitcoin donation address in July of 2011. Another theory, at the time, is that software developer Gavin Andreessen had possibly spooked Satoshi during their communications in the fall and winter of 2010. As I've stated, Andreessen became the public face of Bitcoin following Satoshi's departure and disappearance. However, during emails exchanged between the two, Gavin Andreessen told Satoshi that he was going to meet with the CIA, due to some questions they wanted to ask him about his involvement with Bitcoin. This seemed to predate Satoshi's departure by mere weeks. Other Bitcoin enthusiasts began to wonder if Satoshi Nakamoto 
the pseudonym used by the mysterious Bitcoin founder, had simply vanished because his or her job was done. Perhaps the founder had realized that Bitcoin needed to be created by a mysterious third party, and could be handed off to others after it showed that it could stand up on its own two feet. Gavin Andreessen himself seemed to lend credence to these theories when he announced on April 26th, 2011, quote, Satoshi did suggest this morning that I should try to de-emphasize the whole mysterious founder thing when talking publicly about Bitcoin. Many continued to ask questions about the departure of Satoshi Nakamoto and the meaning of it. Was Satoshi forced out of Bitcoin for some undetermined reason? Did they leave voluntarily? Were they afraid for their life? Had they become so confident in Bitcoin that they knew for the currency to continue growing, they needed it to stand on their own, with no central authority? It was, and still is, impossible to tell. But approximately two years after the first release of Bitcoin, its mysterious founder was gone, leaving it in the hands of the earliest adopters, who continued implementing changes in the code and the future design of the software. Many credit Satoshi for creating the program, but say that the software itself was very rough around the edges. Effective, yes, but somewhat sluggish. Mike Hearn, an ex-Google software engineer that contributed to the code, said about Satoshi, quote, He released Bitcoin to prove his ideas could work. It wasn't written to be a long-term sustainable product. Hearn credits Gavin Andreessen and the other programmers that took over for Bitcoin for revamping the system and giving it legs for long-term growth. He says that Satoshi was brilliant, but he describes the code itself as being somewhat quirky. Dan Kaminsky, one of the world's foremost internet security researchers, examined the code and the product himself in the early 2010s. He believed that he would be able to crack the system quite easily, but was surprised to find that that was not the case. Quote, when I first looked at the code, I was sure I was going to be able to break it. The way the whole thing was formatted was insane. Only the most paranoid, painstaking coder in the world could avoid making mistakes. Kaminsky tried to orchestrate multiple types of attacks against Bitcoin security, but all of these attacks were thwarted in one way or another. Kaminsky said about Satoshi and the software they had created, quote, He's a world-class programmer with a deep understanding of the C++ programming language. He understands economics, cryptography, and peer-to-peer -peer networking. Either there's a team of people who worked on this, or this guy is a genius. This thought was shared by Stuart Haber, a researcher for HP Labs in Princeton that also served as the director for the International Association for Cryptologic Research. Quote, Whoever built this has a deep understanding of cryptography. They've read the academic papers, they have a keen intelligence, and they're combining the concepts in a genuinely new way. Bitcoin continued to scale in the following years, growing more and more popular. Satoshi Nakamoto had always dreamed of it being used as an online currency that was widely accepted. And that dream became more and more idealized as multiple vendors began to implement it in payment portals. This included Microsoft, Steam, PayPal, Newegg, and dozens more. As Bitcoin continued to grow, many more became curious about its mysterious creator and where they had disappeared off to. After all, Bitcoin was continuing to grow in value, turning Satoshi's 1 million Bitcoins into a small fortune. When they had disappeared, bitcoins were worth just pennies. But as the bitcoins grew past a dollar, it became apparent that the enigmatic Satoshi Nakamoto had created an open-source computer program that increased their own wealth. Many thought that Satoshi Nakamoto was none other than Gavin Andreessen, the heir apparent to the bitcoin organization, who became the public face of the currency following Satoshi's departure. However, Andreessen provided his own correspondence with Satoshi up for any skeptics, and emphatically addressed the rumors in multiple statements. Quote, I am not Satoshi Nakamoto. I have never met him. I have had many email conversations with him. Nobody knows who he is. So you've been emailing with this guy for a long time? I did, yeah. From 2010 until he left in March or April of 2011, yeah. Do you think you know who he is? I don't know. Do you think you've met him? Uh, probably. I, mean, I like to think that he would have gone to a Bitcoin conference or 
or uh, you know, hung out with other Bitcoiners. Does it matter who he is? There's a, there's a fascination, a grand fascination with this, this character. And was that, you think, done on purpose? I don't think it was done on purpose. I don't think Satoshi like, meant to create uh, some interesting creation myth. Although I actually think it doesn't hurt Bitcoin that we have this interesting creation myth of you know, a mysterious founder. I think he just it doesn't want public spotlight, public attention. Hey everyone, Michael here. I want to pause the show for just a minute to tell you about today's sponsor, Care of. Care of is a monthly subscription vitamin service that delivers completely personalized vitamin and supplement packs right to your door. Their online quiz asks you about your diet, health goals, and lifestyle choices, and then informs you what vitamins and supplements would work best for you. Your vitamins get delivered right to your door in personalized, easy-to-remember daily packs which are perfect for a busy, on-the-go lifestyle. Your monthly subscription box can be easily modified at any time, and can be tailor-made to anyone's needs. Whether you be vegan, vegetarian, or need special considerations, such as pre- or postnatal supplements, I've found that Care-of makes it very easy for me to learn what vitamins I've been lacking, and group them together into daily packets that I could take right after my morning coffee. It's easy, simple, and most important, it's good for me. For 25% off your first month of personalized care of vitamins, visit takecareof.com and enter promo code UNRESOLVED. Once again, the website is takecareof.com and you can use the offer code UNRESOLVED to save 25% on your monthly vitamin subscription. Now, back to the show. In March of 2014, an article in Newsweek claimed to have learned the true identity of the founder of Bitcoin. A California man is the focus of international attention this morning. Newsweek reports that he is the mastermind behind Bitcoin. The digital money is now accepted by merchants all around the world, but the creator has been a mystery. In a moment, we'll talk to the Newsweek author who says she tracked him down. The person in question was a Japanese-American man named Dorian Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto, who lived in Temple City, California, right on the outskirts of Los Angeles. He was an ex-engineer and programmer that was in his early to mid-60s, and who had raised a family in the area. Some of his children were identified in the Newsweek article, published by author Leah McGrath Goodman. The article itself explored Dorian Nakamoto's past, including his career in systems engineering for classified defense projects, and working as a computer engineer for several financial information companies. In the article, journalist Leah McGrath Goodman says that when asked about his involvement in Bitcoin, Dorian Nakamoto responded by saying, quote, I am no longer involved in that and I cannot discuss it. It's been turned over to other people. They are in charge of it now. I no longer have any connection. After this publication, in March of 2014, Dorian Nakamoto would claim that this was all a huge misunderstanding. He said that he had misheard the question, and believed it was related to some prior work he had done for Citibank. However, at this point, the damage was done. Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto was outed to the world as the founder of Bitcoin, and journalists and investigators began rummaging through his past. It was discovered that he had been laid off twice in the mid-1990s, a pair of decisions that ultimately resulted in him becoming a staunch libertarian. It was also discovered that Dorian Nakamoto had insisted that his children start businesses of their own, which were, in his words, quote, not under the government's thumb. The next several months saw an escalation in the hunt for the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto, with many thinking that Dorian Nakamoto fit the bill. After all, he did have a history of working as an engineer for classified defense projects and financial institutions, had political ideals that seemed to match up with the Bitcoin founder, and the usage of the name alone raised some suspicions. But funnily enough, an online account belonging to THE Satoshi Nakamoto became active again on March 7th, 2014, roughly three years after originally falling silent. The account posted just one comment online, quote, I am not Dorian Nakamoto. 
The account has not been active again in the years since, and many wonder whether it was actually Satoshi Nakamoto who made the comment, or someone who gained access to the account. It remained undetermined whether or not Dorian Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto had any involvement in Bitcoin, but he would attempt to defend himself against allegations in the coming months. Why did you create Bitcoin, sir? Okay, no, no questions right now. I want my free on. <laughs> sir, can we <laughs> ask you about no, Bitcoin? No, Why no, were you no, involved no, in Bitcoin? Okay, I'm not involved in Bitcoin. Okay. Who's involved in Wait Bitcoin? Wait a minute. I want free lunch first. I'm going to go with this guy. Uh, I'm not in Bitcoin. But your, your address not in... Not in Bitcoin. I don't know anything about Did it. Did you create the math for Bitcoin? Okay. The main reason I'm here is to clear my name that I have nothing to do with Bitcoin. Nothing to do with developing. Um, I was just an engineer doing something else. Okay. And if you look at the time span, 2001, when it was supposed to be developed, uh, I wasn't there. I was working for the government through a contracting company. Over the next year or two, Dorian would receive threats against his life and had to seriously consider sending his family away for their own safety. Some that believed him to be the mysterious Bitcoin founder began trying to extort and blackmail him, a scare tactic that would become commonplace for those associated with the founding of Bitcoin. However, others in the Bitcoin community tried to make it right with Dorian Nakamoto, who had his life nearly ruined after claims of his involvement reached the press. In response, Bitcoin enthusiasts set up an account address for Dorian Nakamoto and began sending in Bitcoin as a sort of apology. Andreas Antonopoulos, the CSO for Blockchain.org, explained this in an interview. Quote, If this person is not Satoshi, then these funds will serve as a sorry for what happened to you. It serves to soften the damage caused by irresponsible journalism and to demonstrate the generosity and empathy of the community. It has not been proven whether or not Dorian Nakamoto had any involvement in the creation of Bitcoin, but he would eventually sell all of his Bitcoin he received in donations in December of 2017, after the price had reached what was its high point. It is estimated that he made upwards of $270,000 from the Bitcoin received in the aftermath of the Newsweek publication. Another candidate that lived in Southern California was none other than Hal Finney. Hal Finney was a cryptographic and cryptocurrency pioneer who had spent decades working on encryption projects. He had been involved with several incarnations of cryptocurrency and was regarded as a genius in the field. Hal Finney, who lived just a few blocks away from Dorian Nakamoto, was the second person to use Bitcoin, after only its mysterious founder. He had received some Bitcoin from the mysterious Satoshi as a part of some early test transactions. In a 2014 forum post, Hal Finney described his involvement with Bitcoin. Quote, When Satoshi announced the first release of the software, I grabbed it right away. I think I was the first person besides Satoshi to run Bitcoin. I mined block 70-something, and I was the recipient of the first Bitcoin transaction, when Satoshi sent 10 coins to me as a test. I carried on an email conversation with Satoshi over the next few days, mostly me reporting bugs and him fixing them. Today, Satoshi's true identity has become a mystery, but at the time, I thought I was dealing with a young man of Japanese ancestry who was very smart and sincere. I've had the good fortune to know many brilliant people over the course of my life, so I recognize the signs. Hal Finney says that he remained slightly involved in the coding effort over the next several months, suggesting fixes to the blockchain system, but eventually became overwhelmed with his own life's issues. You see, Finney had been diagnosed with ALS in 2009, and knew that the disease carried with it a shortened life expectancy. Quote, the next I heard of Bitcoin was late 2010, when I was surprised to find that it was not only still going, Bitcoins actually had monetary value. I dusted off my old wallet, and was relieved to discover that my Bitcoins were still there. As the price climbed up to real money, I transferred the coins into an offline wallet, where hopefully they'll be worth something to my heirs. At the time of this forum post, in March of 2014, Finney's ALS had worsened. He was fully paralyzed at this point, and lacked motor function to perform basic tasks without assistance. 
Finney's name was raised by some journalist as a possible candidate for the Bitcoin founder, especially when it was discovered that he had lived just blocks away from Dorian Nakamoto. Both had lived in Temple City, California for over a decade, and had essentially been living parallel lives. However, there was no proof or evidence that the two even knew each other. A writing analysis of Hal Finney's online postings also revealed that his writing style was very similar to that of Satoshi Nakamoto's. In fact, out of all of the Bitcoin candidates that would emerge over the last decade or so, Hal Finney's writing remains the most similar, as confirmed by a number of highly regarded firms that performed this analysis. Unfortunately, Hal Finney passed away in August of 2014. It remains unknown whether he had more involvement in Bitcoin than he confessed. And, due to his experience with cryptography and encryption, it is unlikely that he has any secrets left to be uncovered. In 2015 and 2016, one of the more divisive Satoshi Nakamoto candidates emerged, in the form of an Australian businessman and computer scientist named Craig Stephen Wright. In December of 2015, Wired and Gizmodo ran articles detailing the potential involvement of Craig Wright in the creation of Bitcoin. They wrote that they had been contacted by an anonymous source who claimed to have hacked the email account of Craig Wright. There, inside his account, they said that they had found definitive proof that Wright had used the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto to create the world's leading cryptocurrency. According to both Wired and Gizmodo, Craig Wright had created Bitcoin alongside his friend and business partner, Dave Kleiman. Wright was an Australian businessman who had worked for several alternative currency funds and had worked to establish Bitcoin banks in the preceding years. Kleiman, on the other hand, was a former detective turned forensic computer scientist who had been permanently disabled following a 1995 motorcycle accident. Kleiman had died in April of 2013 and, allegedly, held the private keys for the accounts owned by Satoshi Nakamoto. Following his death, those keys remained hidden and untouched. Immediately following this publication, the home belonging to Craig Wright was raided by Australian authorities, a raid that he claims was related to an audit of one of his multiple businesses. Wright spent the next several days scrubbing his internet presence, but would publicly surface about six months later. He claimed to be the creator of Bitcoin, saying that he was the mysterious Satoshi Nakamoto. In an interview with the BBC in May of 2016, he provided proof in the form of a digital key. My name is Craig Wright and I'm about to demonstrate um, a signing of a message with the public key that is associated with um, the first transaction ever done on Bitcoin. And who does the world think did that first transaction? What's the name associated with that first transaction? The monkey is Satoshi Nakamoto. So you're going to show me that Satoshi Nakamoto is you? Yes. Some people will believe, some people won't. And to tell you the truth, I don't really care. But you can say, hand on heart to me, I am Satoshi Nakamoto. I was the main part of it. Other people helped me. Why did you feel, though, that you had to come out? Or, and why did you feel you had to keep secret for so long? I would prefer to be secret now. I don't think I should have to be out there. There's nothing owed to the world where I have to come out and say, I am X, I am Y. I mean, no one needs to do that. It is my right not to say I did something. If I release a paper that actually benefits people, why do I have to actually take credit for it? Why do I? Wouldn't you be proud to be known as Satoshi Nakamoto? Yeah, but that doesn't mean I have to bounce around in front of TV cameras. Uh, you could say you've invented something amazing and that you'd want to, you'd want to say, I am the man who invented this. I want to work. I want to keep doing what I'm doing, and that's what I'm going to do. And I don't work and invent and write papers and code by coming in front of TVs. I don't want money, I don't want fame, I don't want adoration, I just want to be left alone. Why now? Why have you decided to identify yourself 
as Satoshi Nakamoto? I didn't decide. I had people decide this matter for me. And they're making life difficult, not for me, but my friends, my family, my staff. I have staff here in London, I have staff overseas. And they want to be private. They don't want all of this to affect them. And I don't want any of them to be impacted by this. None of it's true. There are lots of stories out there that have been made up. And I don't like it hurting those people I care about. So I'm going to do this once and once only. I'm going to come in front of a camera once and I will never ever be on a camera ever again for any TV station or any media ever. This digital key provided by Craig Wright seemed to be good enough proof for many in the Bitcoin community. This included Gavin Andreessen, the public face of Bitcoin, who said as much a short time later. I do think Craig is Satoshi. I met with him in London. Uh, he fits the kind of person that I was interacting with way back in 2010, and he provided some cryptographic proof uh, using the private key from the very first Bitcoin block uh, to show that he possessed that key. So although it's impossible to prove something like that 100%, I think uh, for me, he's proved it beyond a reasonable doubt. Craig Stephen Wright claimed that he would publicly provide proof that he was the founder of Bitcoin, but that claim went unfounded. Whatever evidence he felt confident enough disclosing behind closed doors remained confidential. And eventually, Wright said that he wouldn't, quote, keep jumping through hoops to prove his identity. All right. Oops, sorry. All right. Here, here, here. Please on here, because this is being live-streamed, I found out, and uh, I'll get you on uh, Nakamoto, uh, I have uh, dual questions. So first, concerning your blog post uh, about you proving to be Satoshi, uh, why had it a fake proof? And secondly, uh, someone mentioned it already, it will be a hard fork what you are proposing, so will you dump your millions of Bitcoins on the old chain and buy your new uh, Bitcoin Unlimited coins? That's my question. Um, quite frankly, none of your business. I have my economic sovereignty. I am financially secure. I'll do whatever the fuck I want with my money. That's the nature of Bitcoin. It is about financial sovereignty. And that means not answering to anyone about what the fuck I want to do. There is no fucking king. There is no glorious leader. One thing I will do, yes, Someone got it right. I am here to kill off Satoshi. Not in the way that you want, because there is not going to be some great leader standing above. It is not going to be what Core tried to do with Nick. There is not going to be one person that we come and answer to. It will be the best ideas, the best solutions. Not because you think they're the best, because the market does, and the market votes with their dollars. And eventually, the market is going to vote with their bloody bitcoins. In the years since, many have pointed to Craig Wright's history of backtracking and outright fabricating large parts of his life. On his LinkedIn profile, it was noted that many of his academic qualifications as well as sections of his work history and his customers, were fabrications. As you heard in that audio clip, he has also remained very hostile towards skeptics, who want him to take simple steps to prove his identity as Satoshi Nakamoto. On CNN, economic expert Bruce Fenton was asked about what Craig Wright would need to do to prove his identity, and claimed that it wasn't anything drastic. It could be as simple as moving one Bitcoin out of an account tied to Satoshi Nakamoto. Now, you're the executive director of the Bitcoin Foundation, which is an advocacy group for the currency. First and foremost, do you believe that man I just showed, Craig, uh, whatever his name is, is, is the man? Okay. I don't think there's enough information to say yet. Hang on, you've read the blog? Yes. And he's given his 
cryptography address or signature right and he's given all the ways in which he did it yeah so why do you doubt well there's the signature that he gave is not conclusive proof and there's a lot of bright cryptographers a lot smarter than me who've looked at that and they don't believe it some believe it most i would say don't right now um the other compelling piece of evidence was uh, a couple other experts have met him and talked to him one is gavin andreessen um who is is one of the early and prominent developers in bitcoin met him and, and he is convinced so that that speaks volumes to me but still not enough to convince me personally is there a way conclusively to prove it probably not ever a way to conclusively prove it because of the nature of bitcoin because someone could always be hacked but there are other transactions he could do that would definitely give me and probably almost everybody in the industry pretty high degree of confidence right i mean i do not understand it i'm, I'm not going to sit here and feign um, intelligence on this when I've got no knowledge of how Bitcoin works other than the fact it does work but I, I was reading that Satoshi Nakamura there are ways in which he could send something out with the signature of Satoshi on it that would lead people to say yep you're the man yes there's this same er, basically an early block that uh, a, a, a uh, Bitcoin that are pretty much known to be owned by Satoshi if he sent something publicly in in the future said he's going to do it tomorrow or something like that that would be helpful why would he not why would he not do something conclusive you could you'd have to ask him it is indeed possible that Craig Wright was one of the main creators of Bitcoin even skeptics have remained optimistic that he could prove his identity in one way or another but they often point to his relationship with Dave Kleiman as a potential roadblock Dave Kleiman was Wright's alleged business partner, who he corresponded with throughout the 2000s. It is believed that the two worked together to create Bitcoin, as Wright has openly admitted that the two worked together on the 2008 Bitcoin white paper under the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto. Perhaps Kleiman held many of the digital keys needed to access the accounts owned by Satoshi, and that is why Craig Wright remains unable to access those funds. Dave Kleiman passed away in April of 2013, and since then, his estate has filed a lawsuit against Craig Wright. This lawsuit, which was for a sum upwards of $5 billion, alleges that the two worked together to create Bitcoin, but that Wright left Kleiman destitute and broke in his last days. Only time will tell what happens as a result of that lawsuit, but it will hopefully shed some light on the true nature of Craig Wright's claims. To this day, Many in the Bitcoin community still believe that Craig Wright's involvement is nothing more than a well-orchestrated hoax. Another possible candidate for creating Bitcoin is a private San Francisco businessman and computer scientist named Nick Sabo. Considered the godfather of cryptocurrency, Sabo created a proposal for a cryptocurrency named Bitgold in the late 1990s. Bitgold, often considered the direct precursor to Bitcoin, shared many similarities with the later product, albeit in a much more antiquated sense. Sabo had used pseudonyms in the past, and has been well known for remaining off the grid. Even though he is a wealthy investor and creator, not much is publicly known about him. Throughout 2007, Sabo kept a blog in which he talked about theoretical changes he would make to Bitgold to make it more effective. He even spoke about reviving his cryptocurrency dream, which had ended years prior. This timeline roughly fit into when Satoshi Nakamoto claimed to have begun working on Bitcoin. Nick Sabo posted on his blog on December 27th, 2008, saying that he was looking for programmers and others interested in working in a cryptocurrency software. Quote, anyone want to help me code one up? As we now know, the Genesis block of Bitcoin was created just a week or so later, on January 3rd, 2009. At around the same time that Satoshi Nakamoto disappeared, in the first half of 2011, Sabo appeared to stop posting on his blog as frequently, and many consider this behavior similar to that of the mysterious Bitcoin founder. Sabo has continued to remain one of the prime candidates for Satoshi, with financial author Dominic Frisbee stating that Sabo is the only person in the world who has the knowledge and experience to create Bitcoin. New York Times journalist and digital gold author Nathaniel Popper also stated that, quote, the most convincing evidence pointed to a reclusive American man of Hungarian descent named Nick Sabo. 
Sabo doesn't speak publicly that often, but has denied being Satoshi Nakamoto on numerous occasions. Quote, As I've stated many times before, all this speculation is flattering, but wrong. I am not Satoshi. One theory that I haven't really touched on yet is the possibility that Bitcoin was created as part of a group effort, belonging to not just one individual, but several. This theory can be traced back to the earliest days of Bitcoin, when Dan Kaminsky publicly floated this theory after examining the code of Bitcoin. He noted that the program seemed to be meticulously created, with plans for every possibility. With over 31,000 lines of code, this was a pretty improbable task for a single individual, especially one that no one knew anything about. Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever they were, had created a nearly impervious program and managed to keep their presence a complete secret from the world's best hackers and programmers. To Dan Kaminsky, this indicated a group effort, which put breadcrumbs out there leading in a thousand different directions, but left nothing incriminating behind. Quote, I suspect Satoshi is a small team at a financial institution. I just get that feeling. He's a quant who might have worked with some of his friends. One group in particular has been singled out as possibly creating Bitcoin under the pseudonym of Satoshi Nakamoto. This is a trio of men named Neil King, Vladimir Oxman, and Charles Bry. On August 15th, 2008, just months before the release of Bitcoin, and three days before the domain Bitcoin.org was registered, these three men filed a patent for an encryption key. This patent was very similar to the key system used by Bitcoin, and was filed as patent number 201-0004-4841. These three men, King, Oxman, and Bry, worked together and filed several patents over the years. These were generally related to encryption, nodes, and networking, but each have established patents individually, under their own names. It is also worth noting that the language from the patent they filed together, just days before the first emergence of Bitcoin on the internet, shared much of the language seen in the 2008 Bitcoin white paper. In fact, some of the phrases are exact replicas. All three have denied being associated at all with Bitcoin, and deny wholeheartedly being Satoshi Nakamoto. However, many think that the likelihood between the creation of Bitcoin and the technology they innovated together is too great to be a mere coincidence. In 2017, Bitcoin reached its highest high yet. The price of Bitcoin reached $20,000 in November and December, earning the cryptocurrency airtime on almost every news broadcast and causing a major rush to collect and sell Bitcoins before the bottom finally dropped out. At this point, Wall Street itself started taking an interest in Bitcoin. Now, major companies and investment firms have begun investing in Bitcoin and are trying to cash in on the cryptocurrency craze. Almost every financial institution has associates that are in charge of monitoring the digital currency market, which Bitcoin has emerged as the undisputed leader of. This includes firms such as Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, who have implemented digital currency trading desks into their investment system. The first half of 2018 saw Bitcoin drop dramatically in price, dipping below $10,000 per. However, the price has maintained itself relatively high, with the current price of a Bitcoin fluctuating somewhere between $6,000 and $8,000. It is estimated that Satoshi Nakamoto, who holds nearly a million Bitcoin in his or her accounts, would become one of the richest individuals in the entire world if they were to offload their Bitcoin. If we use a modern conservative estimate to evaluate Bitcoin at roughly 6,000 per, then Satoshi, who owns 980,000 Bitcoins, would be worth nearly $6 billion. Just remember, that's a conservative estimate. In the summer of 2018, just a few weeks ago in fact, a curious story broke regarding the enigmatic Satoshi Nakamoto. A handful of news articles stated that a book was planned for the near future, written by the mysterious Bitcoin creator. This book would detail the creation of the digital currency, and would reveal some of the world's first details about the person behind the veil, 
A 21-page excerpt named Duality was published on a website called nakamotofamilyfoundation.org, a domain that was purchased just three days beforehand through Amazon's domain registrar. An excerpt read, quote, I'm going to take a minute here to explain something. I know that some of you might be reading this or hearing about it for the first time, might not know, so I should state it publicly, although by now it is assumed, but has never been publicly shared before, so I shall make it official. Satoshi Nakamoto is not a real name, specifically, not a legal name. It is primarily the essence of thoughts and reason. I wanted the most common name, which I knew no one outside of Japan had any recollection that Satoshi Nakamoto was the equivalent of John Smith. It took time for the public to come to this conclusion, but most with direct access to me had figured it out long ago. Moving on. The excerpt goes on to detail the alleged early days of Bitcoin, going into some of the technology used, and the program's creation. However, it also includes personal details of the writer. The person behind this excerpt explains that they were a university researcher in the early days of Bitcoin, that they likely lived on the east coast of the United States, that their mother was an author, and their grandmother had started a small publishing company many years before. I only paused because the word company is used in quotation marks, so take that as you will. The author of this excerpt says that Bitcoin only succeeded because it Quote, arose out of the many failed attempts by many groups, and the only reason it succeeded was because it was at the right place, at the right time. Despite many of these facts seeming to correlate with what we know about the early days of Bitcoin, and its creator, it has not been proven that this book is anything more than a complete fabrication. The identity of Satoshi Nakamoto remains a highly divisive debate among cryptocurrency enthusiasts. Many believe that Satoshi chose not to reveal their identity to the world, and that we should all respect their wishes. Similarly, others think that publicly outing Satoshi, as a mere mortal, will only damage the integrity of Bitcoin, and invalidate the appeal of the digital currency. After all, it was created to be devoid of any central authority, and wouldn't a messianic figure go against all of that? It has been stated that the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has figured out the identity of Satoshi. In 2017, journalist Alexander Muse wrote that the DHS had used Nakamoto's writings to pinpoint the creator. After plugging them into a database that compiled trillions of writings from around the globe, this included books, online postings, emails, and many other samples of writing. Alexander Muse, in his article, wrote that the federal government desperately needed to figure out the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto, as they feared that the creator of Bitcoin might be some kind of state actor. The Obama administration, according to Muse, feared that Bitcoin might eventually be weaponized, and used against the US's current system of currency. To many, this remains one of the most tangible fears of Bitcoin, and its creator. It's possible that there was no one man or woman behind the creation of Bitcoin. After all, it has been used to transfer money, anonymously, between various figures around the globe. It has been used by anti-government organizations, such as Wikileaks, as well as by illegal operations, such as the Silk Road. At one point or another, figures involved with these operations have been tentatively tied to the creation of Bitcoin, but nothing definitive has been linked. Some think that a powerful government might be behind the creation of Bitcoin. Perhaps Russia, China, or even the United States government itself. Theories float around that these world powers, with some speculating that these government entities saw the writing on the wall, wanted to corner the cryptocurrency market before anyone else. And before you call me a conspiracy theorist for simply thinking that, it's worth noting that large-scale projects like that do have a root in government programs. After all, both onion routing and the internet itself spawned from government projects with the idea for onion routing spawning from employees in the U.S. Naval Research Lab just years before Bitcoin itself was created. This eventually spawned the Tor Project, now known as the Tor Network. It's possible that some government saw the practical uses of crypto, and decided to corner the market before some radical party cropped up. However, on the flip side, it's still indeed very possible that Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever they were, was actually one of these radical parties someone who did not have any faith in the current banking system, and wanted to establish an alternative. In the process, they might have wanted to destabilize the system for either good or bad intentions. 
This leads us to two differing theories, each of which are pretty easy to identify. There is the good Satoshi hypothesis, which believes that the founder of Bitcoin had good intentions. They wanted to provide a valuable cryptocurrency which would allow for anonymous transfers of money, and grow to provide a plus for the world's economy. In this situation, Satoshi simply worked to bring Bitcoin to fruition, following the economic recession of 2007 and 2008, and then decided to take a step back. In this scenario, Satoshi wanted to take the power away from the bankers and simply give it back to the people. Then, there is the bad Satoshi theory. This scenario states that Satoshi was interested in creating a cryptocurrency for some kind of nefarious purpose. Perhaps they wanted to accumulate wealth, selfishly, and wanted to build up a system that would allow them to cut and run with a million bitcoins. Perhaps they even wanted to destabilize the current economic system, taking away wealth from our established currency. The mysterious creator of Bitcoin has left behind quite the legacy. In less than a decade, Satoshi Nakamoto has changed the economic landscape. Before 2009, cryptocurrencies were just a pipe dream, a fantasy for cypherpunks and computer nerds. Now, they are a reality. A reality worth tens of billions of dollars. Several journalistic entities have tried to figure out the identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. The New Yorker, Fast Company, Wired, Forbes, The Washington Post, The New York Times. Countless newspapers and online sources have conducted full-scale investigations to figure out the enigmatic figure at the forefront of the crypto revolution. All have come up empty. I have proposed a lot of interesting candidates, but there remains one easy method for anyone to prove their identity. Satoshi Nakamoto continues to hold 980,000 bitcoins in addresses that are regularly monitored by bitcoin enthusiasts. The real Satoshi Nakamoto, wherever they are, needs to only move one in order to prove their identity to the rest of the world. Many do not want Satoshi to be revealed, not only because doing so would undermine his purpose, to serve as an anonymous figure for an encrypted currency system, but because it would open up Satoshi to all kinds of attacks, not only physical, from those that have called in swatting and extortion attempts against cryptocurrency pioneers and stakeholders, but geopolitical. After all, Bitcoin has become an international powerhouse worth billions of dollars. It is the cutting edge of digital currencies, and every world government would love to have Bitcoin, and its creator at their whim. What wouldn't stop a hostile nation from taking advantage of that, and using the wealth of Bitcoin to their advantage? The true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto is still unknown, and their story remains unresolved. Thank you for listening to Unresolved. I will not bore you with a prolonged outro this week, but I just want to give another thank you to my friend, a concerned citizen, who hosts the Swindled podcast. It is seriously one of the best podcasts out there, and it covers white-collar crime. They're currently preparing for their second season, so now's the best time to get caught up. Go check them out if you haven't. If you want to learn how to get in touch with this podcast, you could do so by heading to unresolved.me. You can find everything there, including links to the social media pages, episode transcripts, a link to the Patreon page, contact information, etc. It's all there. 
Without depressing everyone, we are coming up to the end of this season of Unresolved, which has been our longest and biggest season yet. I have a few more episodes in the works, including one that's very local to me, but I'll be taking a short break in September, so just keep that in mind. I do plan on releasing a few more episodes before then though, to try and wrap up this season with some intriguing and possibly terrifying Unresolved stories. Until next time everyone, stay safe and I will talk to you later.